So there's a bunch of things that we want to cover in this hour today. Uh, scale theory, hand stretches, practicing rhythm, staying in time, and some playing exercises. These are all the things that Key Shreds requested that I cover tonight. And gosh, that is a lot of information. So, and we could spend, you know, a, a day and sometimes a whole course just on one of those topics. So I'm going to kind of pull out some things I think are important and kind of the, the main uh, part of this session is going to be focused on uh, the theory. But since people are still kind of coming in uh, and maybe printing off those PDFs, uh, then I will, uh, I'll get to the other stuff here first. So um, it brought, it was brought to my attention that a lot of people want to know some hand stretches and I do, uh, there's basically just two hand stretches that I do. Um, and I have been injured before. So that is something that I pay quite a bit of attention to. So I want to talk not just about hand stretches, but also about just general ergonomics in terms of playing the guitar and things to kind of watch out for. And what I watch out for with my students and, and myself too. So the two basic stretches, one is you know, holding, I use my, my left hand is out here. That's my fretting hand. And I'm just going to gently pull back on those fingers. Not too hard, you know, just a little, little bit of a pull. And then I do the opposite as well. And honestly, for more stretches than that, I would encourage you to talk to a physical therapist. They are the specialized teams that musicians go to for um, specific areas of, um, you know, playing and, and maybe some ergonomics issues that they run into. Um, they usually, they always help me when I'm injured. So that's why I say they, they know all the answers and they've studied all the anatomy and they, they can help you figure out what's best for your body. But those two stretches, you know, just nice and easy. Those are what I do. Um, another thing that I really like doing, I always call it uh, being a noodle. So we get really tense when we're playing because we're trying hard. And I think that's really great that we have this passion for this instrument and we want to try to play as best we can. But what what often helps is just to do the opposite. And so I call it being a noodle and, you know, it just involves kind of shaking your body out, you know? So whenever I feel that tension, you know, I kind of shake my body out. I actually do what my dog does after she gets wet and, you know, that kind of shake, she's really, really good at it. And so that kind of shake is what I try to do in my body just to make sure that I stay relaxed. Sometimes when I'm practicing, I will actually post a, a little three by five card on my music stand that says relax, you know, or breathe or center, or something like that. That helps me just kind of get into the zone and remember that those muscles are going to work best. I'm going to play faster, cleaner, better if I'm relaxed. And it, sometimes that feels counterintuitive, especially when we're learning new things. We tend to apply a lot more pressure than necessary. So um, that idea of relaxation, I think, is really, really important. Um, the other couple of things that I use, um, I'm really into, you know, uh, finding a position for my guitar that is comfortable. And one thing I've noticed is that every day I wake up with a new body. <laughs> you know, So what feels right one day is going to not feel so great the next day. And so I, I have a few different things that I use to uh, situate myself uh, so that I play comfortably and you know, stay in that relaxed position and my hands aren't working any harder than they have to. And so one of the things that I use, I, I love these little rests that I can put my, uh, my guitar on and they're contoured you know, for your leg and your guitar goes right on top. And so I put that on my left knee. Sometimes I have it on my right. It just depends on, again, you know, how I wake up in the morning and what feels right to me. So um, I even, you know, honestly, I have two of them because sometimes what feels best for me is to stack them. I think somebody noted in one of my videos, they asked me, how did I get my guitar up so high? Um, and it's because I just stacked two of these guys. So that day, that's what felt really right to me. Um, one of my teachers, his name is John Stoll. I studied with him, he was my second guitar teacher. I was so fortunate to be able to work with him. And he actually played similarly, he has this guitar kind of like this. And what that allows him to do is just get these stretches for these amazing chords. And so anyways, that's kind of my approach for most of the time when I'm practicing. Sometimes I use this device. Um, this is, I'm not going to put it on my guitar right now. It'll take a little time, but this is another device. It's an A-frame. I believe that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, this is made by a guitar teacher. I forget where he's located, somewhere in the U.S. 
And he came up with these to help electric guitar players hold their guitars up without needing a strap, um, but making sure that your, um, your guitar is at the right level. And um, I think, again, that's really helpful to figure out what feels right to you and to have a variety of options if you like to play a lot like I do. So um, those are a couple ideas for holding the guitar. I used to use a guitar strap um, and I, I stopped using those because I had some neck problems and some back problems and I was trying to do too much <laughs> in the world and hurt myself. So those, um, those uh, lips, you know, the, the cushions and everything seems to do really well for me. I advise against the footstools because if you play with a footstool, you get your, your legs at different levels. So, you know, one foot is higher than the other, and then your body's like this. And that's, you know, in the long term, that's pretty terrible for you. So we want to have, um, you know, keep everything really nice and even and uniform. That's generally a good way to go. Uh, they do make guitar straps that go around both shoulders. So that's another option that does even it out, which I think is helpful. And I also have a guitar stand that, that um, you know, allows me to stand up and play, but not have a guitar attached to me. And that's just another, you know, another option I like to have. I like to have a variety because, again, I wake up with a different body every day. So, and I'm stressing this because I think it's really important. I think, you know, keeping in mind these things may be more important than uh, keeping in mind, uh, you know, some hand stretches and things. So it's all kind of a package deal. Uh, another quick thing I want to say about guitars in ergonomics. Um, so I have, uh, I had an injury in my arm. I won't get into it, but it was really resolved once I switched to very small guitars. And Fender made, uh, Fender and Epiphone and Gibson, and I'm not sure if there are others, but I know those brands, they made their guitars with a super narrow neck. So it's like one and a half inches at the nut. They made those in, uh, well, this was a, this is a 1959 Music Master by Fender. Um, and they made those in, in the 1959s to I think 64 or 66, somewhere in there. So a lot of their guitars, electrics and acoustics all have the super narrow neck. That really helps me because I have small hands and I've been injured and I just I want an easy guitar, an easy guitar to play. Um, the other thing is that this is a super, super short scale. So this is 20, I think it's 20.5 or 22.5. I'll have to look that up to make sure. But it's a very short scale on there. And again, that really helps me reach those, those drop two voices for sure. Um, so you've got, you know, I want to have everything I can to help me be able to play as well as I, I want to play. I love that the first chord I played was terrible. <laughs> so I guess I'm a human being too. So um, that's what I want to say about guitars. Um, the newer guitars, you know, they have newer Music Masters and Duosonics. They don't have these narrow necks. They may have short scales, but not this short of a scale. I, you know, try to bug the companies whenever I can to make these because when I bought this guitar, it was, I don't know, 700 or a thousand dollars. It's a student model. It's not a really super great guitar, but now they're going for four or 5,000, which to me is ridiculous. Um, so it's just these older models that have them. So I really lucked out in getting one. Um, I do have a little Jay Terser guitar that also has a pretty narrow neck. It's a three quarter size. And I had to get that one into a shop to have that repaired a little bit to fix it up. But at any rate, um, there's some options for you if you uh, are looking for some ergonomic solutions. Um, the cushions and everything else, I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, I'll put them on, on the web page that I linked to at the end. I have, a, I have an Amazon page on there. So I'm one of those shop persons. So um, if you want to you know, use one of those links, then that money uh, that I generate there helps to uh, go to scholarship funds for some of my students. So it's really helpful if you feel like doing that. But I'll put that link and all the stuff on there um, after this session. So any questions on hand stretches, ergonomic kind of stuff as people are kind of coming in? Hey, Susan. Yeah. I, uh, I was just wondering, how long do you do those hand stretches for? A couple seconds. Yeah. just. You know, maybe that and maybe that, shake it out, and then I go ahead and play. 
you know, I don't, before I go running, I have a whole routine that I do before I play guitar. It's just a little bit, just mostly I'm concerned about staying loose. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so practicing rhythm, uh, I think that's the next thing that I want to talk about here. Uh, practicing rhythm. Uh, I have in, in my guitar method books, I have a bunch of exercises for practicing rhythms. Um, I'm really into music notation and studying things that way. Um, I think that there's, it offers a lot of possibilities and having more possibilities and more options is really helpful in terms of being creative for coming up with new rhythms. Um, I know some people have a, an aversion to reading music, but I do think that it's a, it's a helpful skill not that it necessarily allows you to play music, but that the skills that it teach you, teaches you allow you to do so many other things. So I'm a really uh, strong advocate for reading music. Um, in terms of rhythm and you know, developing your sense of rhythm, I heard some really great advice from a guitar player named Bruce Foreman. And his, his advice, and, and, and I've noticed this too in my studio with my students, is that when somebody comes in and they say that they're going to work on their time or they want to work on their sense of time or their rhythm, a lot of times in their exercises to do that, they end up getting worse and worse. And it's a weird phenomenon. So what I, I agree with what he had said about this, which is you already have a great sense of time. And I think, you know, we're born with these heartbeats, you know, like we've got this great rhythm. We have, an intuitive sense of the rhythm of life and the rhythm of things going on around us. We can, you know, tap your foot to the beat or snap your fingers. Mm -hmm. You can dance a little bit. Um, you know, you have a good sense of time and a good sense of rhythm. I think what, when you're practicing rhythm, it should be something that you go into it saying to yourself, I have a good sense of time. And when you go into it saying, I have a good sense of time and you let go, and you just allow that rhythm and that uh, your sense of time to, uh, so to be heard, then a lot of times you'll have a better you know, experience with that rhythm yeah. development. Um, yeah. In terms of practical tools for practicing your rhythm, I really suggest you, know, you get some, either a drum machine or use, there's so many you know, free YouTube videos with drum beats on it and other things, uh, you know, apps and all that that have different drum rhythms on there. Garage Band is great. You know, mess around with different tempos on that. And also, you know, just play at a variety of grooves. You know, take one chord progression and try it at a variety of grooves. Um, but kind of going into it, just knowing that, you know, you, you've got a good sense of time and you're, you're going to keep developing that. I think that's rather key. I wanted to, I don't know if anybody has um, questions about learning how to sing and play guitar, because that's also something that involves uh, a good sense of time. Um, and so I'm just kind of reading here. If anyone wants to get into that, I can. I see a lot of questions here. I'm hoping, you know, if I can't get to all of them, then I'll, um, I'll try to answer them on, uh, on the website afterwards. So, okay, so if you're singing and playing, here's my strategy for that. Um, one is to play with the recording. You know, play the guitar and try to sing with the recording. Try to match it up that way. Um, and, you know, if you can do that, then that's great. Turn the recording off and see how you do. And, you know, that, that's a good strategy to start with. Another thing that you can try, if it's, especially if it's your own song, is to, you know, put a metronome on very, very key and play just whole notes or half notes on them. Um, yeah. Do you have a question or? Oh, sorry. The, it, it switched over. Um, so to put a metronome on and practice with just whole notes or half notes and singing with a very simple strumming, uh, strumming rhythm. So you know, and then singing your, I'm not going to sing on this because this is being recorded, but if this is your song, you know, just keeping things really simple and maybe the rhythm to the song is actually, but instead just starting that with playing just one, you know, half note or whole note at a time. I think that would be most helpful. And the other thing is to record yourself 
playing the rhythm correctly and recording yourself um, playing, you know, playing the rhythm correctly and then practice singing along with that. And that can sometimes just kind of give you that edge to be able to do that, um, to be able to get that singing and playing together. So I hope that helps kind of get you started on that. Um, but hopefully you can understand the idea of playing just a quarter note or half note or whole note while you're, you're singing and playing. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about staying in time and, and all of that. Um, let's see, next thing we had was the, the scale theory. Is, if everybody is ready for the scale theory. So if you have your, your worksheet, that would be great. So it's on the website. If you haven't checked that out, I've got that available. And so what I wanted to go over today is uh, I wanted to go over major scale construction, major pentatonic scale construction, uh, as well as natural minor and minor pentatonic scales. So these are probably the scales that you play, you know, the patterns for all of them. But um, I'm not sure if everybody knows the theory behind that. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to cover because I think it's really fun to, to cover and talk about. So let me see. I am going to just see if I can use the acoustics of my amp here. So we can get a little more sound. So hopefully that will be heard. And so the first thing up at the top of the worksheet, I have a chromatic scale written out. And the chromatic scale is our musical alphabet. So um, if I were to start on that A string, then I would have the notes A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and A. And then kind of a music teacher trick, I like to use flats when I'm descending. That's something that happens in chromatic lines. And it's also something that um, is very useful for you to help learn the difference or the similarities between the flats and the sharps. So if I were to take that descending from that note A, I would have A, A flat, G, G flat, F, E, E flat, D, D flat, C, B, B flat, and A. And each one of those notes is separated by a half step. So the chromatic scale, entirely half steps on there. And that is one of those things that it just is. <laughs> so there's some things in music theory that I can explain. And there's some things that are just, that's just kind of how they are. And that chromatic scale is one of those things that that's just how the notes are. And uh, that's what they are on the guitar. That's how it lines up on the keyboard as well. That's our, our musical alphabet. And then there's other things that I can't explain, which I want to get into. But I want to go over one other thing that I cannot explain. And I'm hoping you can hear my guitar enough for this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a C major scale. Hopefully people can hear that okay. And hopefully that sounds like a, uh, a major scale to you, or at least it sounds familiar. It sounds like something you've heard before. And if that works, you know, if you can hear something in there, you're like, yeah, it's kind of what I imagine a scale sounds like, then you're, you're gold. <laughs> so that's, that's our first step. There's just knowing that that's what a major scale sounds like. And what I, wanted, what I want you to notice in that major scale sound is that I've got this combination of half steps and whole steps. So from the first note to the second note, I've got a whole step. From the second note to the third note, another whole step. And you can see how I'm skipping a fret with that. From the third to the fourth, I've got a half step there. That's the note E to F. And then from F to G, I've got another whole step. From G to A, that's another whole step. A to B is another whole step, and then B to C is a half step. So if I play this scale pattern, that's the sound of a major scale. And I could start that on any, any note. I'll use the same fret just so you can get that visual. I don't even have to know the names of the notes, but I do. But I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking that pattern of half steps and whole steps and kind of using my ear with that. 
And so not right now, but at some point, I would like you just to try to play a major scale, just like that. And, and especially if you don't know the names of the notes, because that is just going to help me, uh, it's going to help you understand if you can hear a major scale. And in that major scale, that's where we have our chords. That's how we have, where we have most of the harmony that we use in writing pop tunes and contemporary music today. So it's all in that major scale. When we look at the notes on that C major scale, we have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And it turns out that all the notes in the C major scale are all natural notes. There's no sharps or flats. They're all just natural notes in there. So that's really, really important to notice. And on the worksheet, I'm hoping that you're able to look at that worksheet. I do have, uh, it says under number two, um, it's just to analyze the half step and whole step pattern in a C major scale. And what I want you to do is we're going to go through this and just, you know, talk about those notes. And then we're going to use that as a template to create the other major scales. Just a few of them, because I just kind of want to give you an intro to this. Um, so the distance from C to D, that's a whole step. From D to E, that's a whole step. From E to F, anyone know what distance that is from E to F? If anyone wants to pipe up. So E to F, half step, awesome, all right. Uh, and then from G to A, we have a whole step, A to B, uh, sorry, G to A is a whole step, A to B is a whole step, and then B to C. So C major scale on your paper, we have those notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and D. Or, sorry, C, A, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. And in between uh, the third and fourth degree, which is E and F, and in between B and C, which is the seventh and eighth degree, we have half steps there. And with those, those half steps are very important to notice because those are the, the things, those are the, that's a formula for creating these major scales. So this pattern of half steps and whole steps can be transferred to every note. So just like we did that on the guitar, we can do that on paper. And I think it's really helpful to do that on paper, which is why I've got that PDF for you. So first step is I want to create a couple of these uh, major scales with you. And just as a side note, I, I went through a pretty extensive lesson on all of this uh, last year on the for my She Shreds one riff a day. So instead of doing um, uh, riffs each day of just my own choosing like I did this year, last year I actually com composed a lesson for each day of the month. And all that material is available on my website. And there's a YouTube video that compiles everything and the free PDFs and the whole shebang. So I go through this in much greater detail um, on that. So you may want to check that out if you, if you need more, uh, more help with that. So um, the G major scale, that's the one that I want to construct next. And I just want to do that on paper with you. So our first step is just to write out the letter names from G to G. And we're just going to follow that musical alphabet using only natural notes. And we'll, we'll, we'll fix that, you know, a little bit later. Uh, but for right now, our first step is just to write those out uh, using natural notes. So what you'll write in those spaces or on a blank piece of paper is G, A, B, C, D, E, F, and I believe G is written in there for you. And underneath each one of those letters, there is a number, and that is identifying the scale degree for each one of those notes. And so we've got, um, you know, G is one, A is two, B is three, and so on. Now we're going to go back to our formula for the major scale construction in which we discovered that the major scale formula has a half step between the third and the fourth degree, as well as the seventh and eighth degrees. So uh, what I want you to do is just draw a little indicator. So I think I, I, I was trying to show you this before when my uh, connection dropped, but you see up there at the top, I've just got those, uh, those little dashes there between the three and the four and the seven and the eight on the C major scale. So I want you to drop those down to between the three and the four and the seven and the, and the eight for the G major scale. And now our next step, our final step here is we are going to go through this, uh, those notes meticulously and determine if they are half steps or whole steps. So uh, whether they're fitting the formula or not, and then we're going to alter any notes necessary to make it fit the formula and therefore construct that major scale. So from G to A, uh, can someone pipe up if that is a whole step or a half step? Whole step. Perfect. So we don't need to do anything there. And then from A to B, is that a whole step or a half step? Yes. 
Whole step or half step? Whole step. Awesome. And then from, uh, so A to B is a whole step and then B to C, is that a whole step or a half step? Half step. Half, half step. And that's fitting the formula. So, so far everything's grooving. Everything is great. C to D, whole step or half step. So C to D is a whole step. I'll just kind of finish out here. So then D to E is also a whole step. Oh. E to F is a half oh. step. But the formula that we that we drop down indicates that we need a half step between F and G. Um, and we need a whole step between E and F. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna raise that note F to an F sharp. And by doing that, now we have created a G major scale. So G to A is a whole step, A to B is a whole step, B to C is a half step, C to D is a whole step, B to E is a whole step, E to F is now, it's, well, it's F sharp. So E to F sharp is now the whole step that we need and F sharp to G is now the half step that we need. So now we have in fact created a G major scale. So does that make sense? I know I feel awkward teaching, <laughs> teaching this without my whiteboard and on, on Zoom and everything, does, does that make sense to, to some of you at least? It makes sense. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm used to seeing the little sea of hands or you know, I can tell if somebody's perplexed look on their face needs more explaining. So appreciate the shout outs there. Um, so next up, I wanna do the same thing for the D major scale. So our first step is to write out those natural notes starting with D. So we have D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and then D. Our second step is to drop down those indicators. So we wanna put a little marker between three and four and between seven and eight. And our next step is to go through that, uh, those sets of notes and determine if they're half steps or whole steps and whether they fit the formula or not and make any adjustments that we need to. So from D to E, that's a whole step. From E to F, that's a half step, but we need a whole step. So this is where we're gonna increase that F to F sharp. So that gives us the whole step that we need. And then from F sharp to G, that gives us the half step that we need. From G to A is a whole step. From A to B is a whole step. From B to C, that's a half step and we need a whole step there. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna increase that C to C sharp. And by doing that, we get that whole step that we need there. And that also magically <laughs> gives us the half step that we need between C sharp and D. So the way that I'm you know, determining whether it's a whole step or half step, because I know some people get confused with that. You can look up at the top of the page with the chromatic scale and so if you look at the notes C and D, and you notice that there's a C sharp in between those two notes, that's how we're, we're determining that C to D is a whole step because a half step would be C to C sharp. So if there's a note in the middle there, then we've got a whole step. The other way to determine that is if you're on your guitar and you know C is here and D is here, so th that's a whole step away. So C, C sharp, and D. Like, dog's tail is wagging. I don't know why. <laughs> She's excited about guitars too, I guess. So um, that's, those are how I use, uh, I help students kind of determine the difference between whole steps and half steps. So I want to do one more, uh, the key of A. And uh, so we've got the natural notes. We're going to write those out first. We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and A. So that's our first step. And second step is to drop down those indicators. So between three and four and seven and eight, I believe that was on one of my midterm quizzes for students is where are those half steps in a major scale between the three and the four and the seven and the eight. So, and then we're gonna go through and uh, identify those, uh, those half steps and, and whole steps there. So from A to B, we have a whole step. From B to C, we have a half step, but we need a whole step. So we're gonna increase that C to C sharp. From C sharp to D, we have a half step, which we need. From D to E, we have a whole step. 
from E to F. We have a half step, but we need a whole step. So we're going to increase that F to F sharp. From F sharp to G, we have a half step. We need a whole step, so we're going to increase that G to G sharp. And then that le leaves us with the half step that we need from G sharp to A. And so now we've got an A major scale. So I want you to notice a couple of things. Um, one is the C major scale has zero sharps or flats. G the G major scale has one sharp, which is F sharp. The D major scale has two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. And then the A major scale has three sharps, F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp. And I get into that a little bit more um, on my previous year's uh, She Shreds lessons, which you can look up. Um, and, but I just want you to kind of notice that because that's, that's something that is, I think, helpful and useful to recognize. One other thing about sharps, um, when you're writing the sharps, hopefully you can see this on the, the top of the page, uh, how to notate those sharps. So, it's the, you know, for example, we have the letter A followed by A sharp in that chromatic scale there. And the A, that sharp sign, it looks like a pound sign or um, hashtag. So, um, and that goes after the letter. So just to kind of note that. And the, the, uh, the notation for a flat is sometimes reduced just to a lowercase b when we're using a word processing program like I did to create this. So the, the B flat sign is actually, or the flat sign is actually um, a little fancier than what I've got there, but hopefully you'll, you'll understand my notation system there. So those are your major scales, um, a, a few of them, four major scales, C, G, D, and A. And those major scales, again, are where we come up with our harmonic sensibilities. Uh, we build chords from those scales and, um, Again, I have some of that in last year's lesson as well, so I'm not going to get into that. But um, those major scales, they sound, uh, they sound familiar. They're very helpful to use when you're soloing. And on my website, on the page for this lesson, uh, I've actually dropped down a few. I've got a couple links there for, um, to help you link to some jam tracks and all of the keys. And on, those, on that page that it links to, I also have some scale patterns there. So I have major scales, so you can practice those with different root notes um, through all of the, the keys. Um, next up on the page here, I have the major pentatonic scales. And also on the website for all of those jam tracks, I've also listed out fingering patterns for um, the, the, my, or sorry, the major pentatonic scales. So you can use major pentatonic scales and major scales over all of those jam tracks. Um, the major scales, they have two additional notes. Um, they include, well, we'll get into that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. But the major scales, they offer a little more variety. They're a little trickier to use in some cases. So a lot of times people opt for the major pentatonic. And so that's what I want to talk about next. Um, the major pentatonic, it's great. Um, there is a simple formula for the major pentatonic scales. And that is the, we're going to take the, the root note, so the one, two, three, five, and six degrees of the major scale. And those are your notes that make up the major pentatonic scales. So pentatonic means five tones. And so, a, a, you know, the major pentatonic scale is a, you know, major sounding scale that we can use. Um, so I want you to construct those major pentatonic scales on the page there. Um, and I just wrote out the formulas and everything for you on that worksheet, so you can just get right to it. So um, the C major pentatonic scale, the root note is C, one is C. Um, the two, or sorry, yeah, the two, um, just taking that directly from the C major scale and our two and C major, that's why I put those numbers under there. Um, the two is D, so we're gonna use the note D. Uh, the three is E, and then, uh, the next note is the fifth, so that's G, and then the sixth is A, and then we have, I just capped it off with another root note there for, uh, just for fun. <laughs> so you have all of those notes. So we've got five different notes there. And you'll notice, this is in the class, I would say, you know, real quick, what are the notes that are missing? And anyone have any ideas why those two notes are missing from the pentatonic scale? So um, I'm wondering if anyone wants to, wants to chime in on their microphone with that. So I guess four and seven are missing? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure why though. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I love that you're noticing that. So it's, it's the, it's the half steps. Yeah. 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 That's where those half steps are. So that could also mean, you know, if you play, if you play two notes that are a half step apart, you know, this is an E flat and an E natural or an F and an E. I really like that sound. I think those are really cool, creepy sounds, you know, useful in some instances. But any note that's a half step away is is uh, kind of a handle with care note. You want to, you want to pay attention to those notes and uh, you have to know how to use them. So sometimes those notes sound really great to land on, depending on the chord progression. And sometimes they don't sound so great. They have too much tension in there that needs to be resolved. And, you know, if you're not skilled to resolve that tension, then it might just kind of leave you hanging a little bit in that melodic line. So the major pentatonic scales, they're just like all the happy notes, <laughs> you know, and in a lot of chord progressions, those are just gonna, you know, they're pretty safe to use. Um, I like teaching them because they're, um, you know, they're, the fingering patterns are easier. There's two fewer notes and, you know, you can make a lot of cool sounds with those. But, you know, that's what's going on with the, the major pentatonic scales. So next up, I'd love to get to the minor scales. And again, I, I'm a very formula kind of person. So with the minor scale, all we're going to do is take the major scale, lower the third degree, the sixth degree, and the seventh degree. And I've got that all written on that, that sheet there for you. Um, and in, in doing that, you're going to be creating all of the, the minor scales. So I'm wondering if, uh, if somebody can chime in with um, maybe the, the C natural minor scale and, and tell us the, the notes for that. C, uh, D, E flat, uh -huh. F, G, A flat, B flat. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So a C major scale, just to hear the contrast. Right? Uh, I went up to a little D flat there. Let me try that again. All right. And then for C minor. So it still sounds nice. It's just, you know, a slightly different kind of sound with that. So, um, you know, it's a different order of those half steps and whole steps. That's one way that you could think about it. I know a lot of people do. Um, the other way is like I do of just comparing it to that major scale. And um, so that's what I want you to do with the, the next three keys there. So we have the, the G natural minor, the D natural minor, and the A natural minor. So if somebody wants to pipe up with the, um, the G natural minor, that would be great. So G natural minor is um, G A B flat C um, D E flat E or F flat. Yeah, yeah. It'll just be F. That's a really, really great point. Yeah, I love that. So the G major scale has an F sharp in it. That's our seventh degree. And on the sheet, I wrote, I kind of, uh, I, I used a shorthand formula there. I said flat seven. And that doesn't necessarily mean specifically to flat the seven. It means that we're going to lower the seven. So if we lower F sharp down a half step, then what note does it become? Yeah, <laughs> just, just F. So yeah, perfect. All right, so um, let's do another one. Let's do the D natural minor scale. So anyone got that? I mean, I could try. You say the yeah. D natural minor? Yeah. yeah, so D natural minor. So it would be D, E, F, uh -huh. G, A, B flat, uh -huh. C, D. Yeah, bingo. You got it. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. And then we have one more, um, which is the A natural minor scale. And I, I want to I give you guys a tip on this one. So in the key of A, notice how the third, the sixth, and the seventh all have sharps. 
so the A natural minor, we're lowering, we happen to lower all those notes. So the A natural minor scale is beautiful. It's all the natural notes. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. That's all you got to do. So that's a great one. All right, next up, minor pentatonic scales. These are some of my most fun scales to play. Some of my favorite solos use those minor pentatonic scales. And minor pentatonic scales, um, we're just going to pull out specific notes from the minor scales, the natural minor scales that we just created. So for the C minor pentatonic, um, we have C and then E flat and F, G, B flat and C. So I'm just pulling those, you know, you can just, you know, pull those from the, the top part of your worksheet. The G minor pentatonic scale, G, B flat, C, D, F, and G. The D minor pentatonic scale, D, F, G, A, C, D. And then the A minor pentatonic scale, A, C, D, E, G, A. And I'm reading these because I'm nervous because this is being videotaped. <laughs> So I hope you guys can kind of bear with me with that. So appreciate that. Um, yeah, I wrote out a, a couple things beforehand just because I knew my mind might be concerned about audio or something silly like that. Um, so that's why I'm reading from a, from a page <laughs> today. So those are your minor pentatonic scales. Um, and I want to note, we're, we're getting here to the end of the worksheet here. Um, the way that we have been thinking about these minor scales is we've been thinking them, of them in a parallel fashion. And what that means is that we've been comparing C major to C minor. So, and that's why you know, we have these formulas. So the, the formula for a minor scale is, well, we first start with the major scale and then we lower those specific notes. So we have you know, this formula that we apply to that major scale and then we end up with a minor scale. So when you're comparing C major to C minor or G major to G minor, th those would all be parallel, uh, you know, a parallel way of thinking about that. So um, C major's parallel minor is C minor. Um, there's another way to think about these. And some of you may have heard of this concept before, and that is the relative minor. So a relative is, you know, there's a relationship, you know, there's maybe some DNA being shared with that relative. And so the, the major scale I always think of is the parent scale. Um, and the minor scale is there's a relative minor for that. And the, there's a formula that I like to use. And that is that the sixth degree of a major scale will give you its relative minor. And that relative minor shares the same notes, the same key signature as the relative major. So for every key signature, so like the key of C, we have no sharps or flats. There's C major, that's one of the keys, but it can also be A minor. So C major and A minor, those two keys, major key and a minor key, they share the same key signature. And I want you to take a look at that. That's why I included the A major and A minor on your worksheet there. So you can look at, um, you know, if you look at a C major scale, and an A major scale, those, those notes are very different. But if you look at a C major scale and an A minor scale on that sheet, you'll see that they're actually just the same notes in a different order. So another way to think about that is that the A minor is a mode of the C major scale. And that's something that you know, we would get into at another point, but um, that's a, just something I, I wanna kind of float around is the idea of a mode there. Um, one other thing I want to say, and then I want to open this up for questions, is that these scales, I think of scales as being recipes for sounds. Um, I'm not a cook, so when I make food, I'm all about those little prepackaged spice packages, you know, that you get at the grocery store. If I want, you know, Mexican food, I'll, you know, put that in my ground beef. It's pathetic. I understand that. But that's, that's why I live with somebody <laughs> who I love who can cook as well. Um, so, but I think of, especially like that minor pentatonic scale, I think of that as like, that's a particular sound that you get. Um, that's a particular, a particular flavor, kind of garage band sound or, you know, early rock and roll blues kind of a sound. Um, but those are particular, 
you know, they give you, they get you in the ballpark for a specific sound that you're going for. And there's all kinds of scales. This is just the very tip of the iceberg with that. But what is really, I think, key to playing good solos and, and writing and composing good music using scales is to really highlight the notes that are in each chord, otherwise known as the chord tones or arpeggios. So for example, when I'm playing uh, it over a C chord, I'm not thinking of it. I mean, I'm kind of thinking of a C scale, but really I'm thinking, what are the notes in that chord? And I want to highlight those notes. So I will highlight C, E, and G because those happen to be the names of the notes that are in that chord. So when I'm soloing, I'm going to really try to highlight those chord tones that are in there. And when the chord progression changes to, let's say, F, I'm going to highlight the notes that are in that chord. So if I were to go kind of back and forth, Pulling out some of those notes again. I'm getting nervous online here, but um, anyways, that's I think of chord tones in those scales. So when I have a chord progression that goes from a C chord to an F chord, I'm I'm thinking in the key of C, but I'm also really focused on the notes that are in each one of those chords. I'm not thinking. This is a common thing that I've seen a lot of students do. Is I'm not thinking play a C major scale over the C chord, and then when the chord changes to F, play an F major scale. I'm not not thinking that that's a real common mistake I see uh, students try to do and they're like why doesn't this work <laughs> and it's it's for another lesson and I think I may touch upon that a little bit in last year's um, videos as well so I hope you do get an opportunity to check all that out as well so uh, I know we're over time but I, I'm hoping that's okay with our uh, moderator here because um, I, I lost I, I lost myself on the internet <laughs> for a while so um, hoping we can go over a couple minutes and I'd love to, to take your questions um, and uh, yeah, anything else that I can help you with today? I, I have a question, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess it's like, um, sometimes it can be hard to visualize notes on the guitar as opposed to like a piano or something like that. Mm -hmm. Apart from like repetition and then going over maybe your scales, is there like any other trick <laughs> that you could? <laughs> yeah, there are so many tricks, so my first, uh, my first trick is to use many tricks. <laughs> you know, you want to approach this in many different ways, um, and you want to make sure that those ways are musical. And this is my my perspective on it. Um, as I was telling another student earlier in this in the week, you know, there's different recipes for chocolate chip cookies, and I I love lots of different chocolate chip cookies. So take my advice and you know and enjoy that and use that and apply it and also take other people's whatever resonates with you in that respect. So in my studio, um, I do a lot of work with students um, isolating one string at a time. And uh, I have a set of exercises and little drills that we go through with that. Um, I have a YouTube lesson on that as well. I can put a link to that on my page with some uh, checklists and things because I'm a total music nerd. Um, so I use single string studies and then I also do a lot of uh, do some reading music notation. That's another way to help students understand it. I do a lot of chord work with students so that they're, you know, they're thoughtful about the names of the chords and the root notes. I'm a fan of the cage system for beginning and, and intermediate level students. Uh, that's a great way to get to know those, those chords. I also do um, triad inversions. That's another great way to really see those, uh, those chord shapes as well as start to understand those notes. I think that, you know, thing to keep in mind is that you know, you, you can master one exercise and feel like, you know, you understand that. You can, you know, really have a good understanding of that with that one exercise. And then when you try that with, um, you know, you, you try to apply your knowledge to another situation, musical situation, you might find that those notes disappear. And you're like, wait, but I did that one exercise and I know them really well, but it, uh, it's just not, uh, it's not enough. So I use a variety of approaches. I'm always going back and cycling through all of that stuff. And I think, you know, I think having a good teacher is also really helpful because they can direct you in terms of like, how well do you know this stuff? Is it time to move on? Should you go back to this other, um, this other study? You know, they can spot that stuff. 
Um, I know when I wasn't studying with a teacher when I was a kid, which is the majority of the time, um, I would spend a year or two years working on an exercise that really did me no good. So um, I, yeah, I'll post a video on that, on that page for you that I, where I really talk through at least one way to really give a thoughtful study to that. Great question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone wrote, it, wrote a note about a major scale. I do think of a C major scale. It's just that I'm highlighting the chord tones more. So that C major scale, um, that's something that I teach students, you know, first year, you know, definitely first few months. And, you know, they're just playing by feel and by ear on that. And, you know, the, the next level of understanding in, in volume two of my book series, that's where we get into those chord tones. Where you're thinking of the scale patterns and the keys, where you're just more isolated on those chord tones. So that's really where you're going to get those, those really sweet notes in those solos. The ones that you're always saying, like, how did that guitar player know to hit that note at that time? Well, it's a chord tone, most likely. Yeah. Um, triads and cage changed my life. Yes, they changed my life. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, thanks for folks who are heading out and saying goodbye. All right, any other questions? I had a, a question, Susan. Um, yeah. What are what would you say are some general healthy habits for players, new and old? Because like I've been playing for a while, but I haven't been playing guitar. I'm usually a bass player, and cool. now I'm like trying like this beast of an acoustic guitar. Um, uh -huh. But I know I'm also like really hard on myself and I'm also really lazy at the same time. Like, I'm not practicing <laughs> the things that I should be playing. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, so, right. What are some good habits like, you know, as far as goal setting and just like yeah. not overworking yourself and just keeping your higher goals in mind too? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is that's the thing we're all dealing with, uh, you know, different levels of that. First, having an instrument that you love. You know, so you said kind of a bear of an acoustic guitar there. So if a guitar is hard to play or, you know, honestly, if you don't, if you're not looking at it across the room going, oh, I have to work on this thing right now, but I really want to play. You know, I mean, you know how you feel about your, you know, a guitar when you really dig how it looks. So I think that's really important. Um, I think it's important to balance your practice, you practicing all those things that you should practice with things that just make you happy to play. I always try to get my students to practice 10 minutes a day, you know, on like the, you know, kind of in the weight room exercises, the not fun stuff, the drills and all that. And then the rest of the time, that's where you, you, you know, you just play songs that you love, maybe you're writing a song or whatever. Um, but it's, it, I think the trick is to keep it really manageable in terms of time. So setting that 10 minute goal, having a very clear goal, knowing what you're going to practice ahead of time. You don't walk in and say, okay, I'm going to practice. And you're like, all right, what am I going to do? You know, but maybe each week, you know, make a plan. Or if you have a teacher, make a plan with your teacher. So you kind of know like what you're going to be working on for that week. Um, I, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people use this idea of kind of stacking your practice. I know how a lot of people have a hard time finding time in their day to practice. So, you know, what I do is I know when I'm, when I'm in bed in the morning, I want that cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, that's like what I'm thinking about. How am I going to get up and get that cup of coffee? So I have my cup of coffee while I practice guitar. You know, I just, I, I bring it, I bring it to my studio. I sit it down and then I get my coffee and I have to do my warm ups and I do some of the, you know, I have a few things that I should practice that I do every day like that. And, you know, and then I go on with my day and if I, you know, I have a break in between students or something, then I get more time to practice whatever I want, whatever I'm curious about. So I think having things that, you know, having an instrument that you like, having a time of day that you regularly practice those things, keeping it very short, because you can make a lot of progress in a short amount of time. And, you know, rewarding yourself with, you know, playing stuff that you like to play and also acknowledging that you did get a good practice session in that day. I have some of my students text me when they get a good practice session in, you know, if they're trying to build a new habit, like text me and I'll send you a smiley face, you know, like it feels good to like, yeah, we're all in this together. So, and that's again, where having a teacher can really help our friend who's also practicing. It doesn't have to be guitar. It could be anything. But if you have people who you're, you know, kind of holding each other accountable to, that's also very, very helpful. I don't know, does that kind of get at some of your things? <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, anyone else? 
It's now or never. Hi, Susan. Um, I wanted to um, ask about how you, how do you get so good at making all the crazy shapes with your hands and doing it without looking and just easily? So I'm, I'm trying to expand my horizons with like weird jazz chords and stuff like that. Yeah, it's cool. yeah. Um, but I'm finding it so difficult to not physically like place my fingers in mm. uh, in the positions, and it's the more I concentrate, almost it's the worse I'm getting. Um, yeah, so I, I just yeah. wanted to know if there was any way, any little short, <laughs> short yeah, cuts. yeah. First of all, <laughs> I've been watching your videos. You sound awesome. So <laughs> yeah, so you've got like a lot of stuff going for you like so many people in this community you're just blowing my mind i'm like i wish i knew that stuff and play that when i was your age you know like yeah so that's that's really great as far as as far as the chords and stuff go um they're hard you know like sometimes i i just am baffled by the fact that you know i i make my living by pulling down these strings at various <laughs> frets like i'm just lengthening and shortening strings like how weird is that to really think about um so Chords are, so I, I want to ask, how many chords are you trying to learn at once? How many chord shapes are you focused on at once? Uh, probably quite a few. And is it, yeah, lots. Yeah. So I'm doing all like the inversions, trying to learn inversions and stuff at the moment. So there might be quite a few that, is yeah, it better like the, to narrow down and do fewer? I mean, yeah, I, I think so. You okay. know, I'm, I'm, okay. it's so funny. I think it's such a great question. I, when I was having a hard time, I think you're working on the drop two voicings, the inversions of yeah, the neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, those were a bear. So I couldn't even play those until like five years ago because I I was injured for like 10 years or 12 years and I couldn't do them until I got these skinny neck guitars. So there's that. Um, I, I was, back in the day, I was having such a hard time playing those and one of my teachers and colleagues you know, I sat down for a lesson. I'm like, Ron, I'm just having a hard time playing these. I can't do it. My, you know, my arm really acts up. And he said, have you thought about just playing three of the voicings, you know, play three, three strings. And I was like, here's your money. Thank you very much. You know, it's just these simple, simple little things. So I would address that like you do other, um, you know, other problems that are challenges that you see in your life. So break it down. If it's hard to play, I know some of those are so hard to play, you know, down here. So maybe put them up here. You know, that's a really, this is, I think, the hardest one of those uh, inversions to play. And that's the chord I fouled up on and very first brought my guitar out to you guys here today. So, yeah, those inversions are really, really tricky. Um, this is the exercise I use, whether it's for new students learning, you know, an open chord or, you know, one of those tricky versions. Play the chord, I'll do an E chord. And then you slightly release your fingers. I, I have them on top of the strings, but I'm not, I'm not pressing them down. And then I just press them down again. And I do that like 10, 15 times with students. And then you get those little ridges in your fingers. So they're kind of like guides. So your hand could kind of find that way. And then you maybe go up a couple millimeters and you keep going up higher and higher. So until you're kind of dancing, I call this the finger dance exercise. So you could do that with one of these, you know, just play it and then go maybe after, you know, a few uh, 30 seconds or so, you know, maybe try to go up just a little bit. Once you get that to where you can come into that chord, okay, try to move it up a fret and back a fret. And I've noticed that I'm playing on the fifth fret. You might find it easier to start up here. You know, find a place where it's somewhat comfortable to do that and just, you know, really take it slow. Don't expect to get it in a day, a week. You know, this is long-term kind of stuff and you're going to get frustrated and all that. Um, the other thing I want to say this, I think every one of my students who's worked on these has at some point said, come to me in one of their lessons and says, my hand hurts, my arm and it's these voicings. So that's where you really want to limit your practicing, you know? So practice those for like, you know, uh, a very short amount of time. Maybe it's 20 seconds or 30 seconds and then go take a walk. I've had to like set a timer in the other room uh, so that yeah, I make sure that I get up <laughs> to turn the alarm off. Um, the other thing I'll do to stop myself from 
the practicing is drink a lot of water, you know, and then I know I'm going to have to get up at some point, but seriously, I know that sounds kind of silly, but sometimes when you're really working on something, you'll overwork it and, and actually injure yourself. So I want you to really take care of those hands when you're working on that. So just a little, you know, pick one chord and maybe this, I'm choosing the hard one here, but you know, maybe an easier chord to start with and just, you know, just very slowly try to integrate it into your plan. That That's help? amazing. Yeah, that, yeah. that was fantastic. That okay, really, cool, really helps. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Cool. Um, anyone want to ask a final question? And I promise to keep it brief. Oh. So, right. Do you do lessons online? I do. Yeah. yeah. I've had to, I closed my, my physical studio space in 2020 because of the pandemic, huge loss. Um, but yeah, I have been able to, to teach one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons online and this group format again thank you guys for your patience on this because i i've uh, struggled with even offering something like this because i've been worried about the technical difficulties so i appreciate that one-on-one -on -one lessons seem to go a lot easier okay yeah if you can add your info there that'd be great <laughs> yeah yeah it's all on my website so you've got that link um you know with a pdf and all that it's the same site you can look about uh, my method books um, i have two volumes of the guitar lesson companion um and yeah i think that's it so i'm going to sign off i just I, from the bottom of my heart you guys thank you for for being so patient with me and my technology technological difficulties here and uh sharky is uh in full relaxation mode so <laughs> i think i'll rouse her up